And good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. This is the second of two News Lab data visualization roundups with Alberto Cairo. Uh, for those of you that are joining us again from previous session last month, uh, we're going to be going over a wide range of data visualizations, uh, focusing specifically on elections and Olympics, which obviously is going on uh, right now. There's a lot of information going on about that. Uh, if you missed last month's session, uh, and you're interested in checking that out, you can visit our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Google News Lab, uh, where we have this as well as a whole list of other resources, FAQ videos, inspirational videos for you, um, and a lot of additional information. Uh, we are going to be spending the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour talking about data visualization, uh, tips, tricks, uh, and uh, uh, observations that Alberto has uh, based off of his many, many years of experience uh, doing this type of work. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background, if you're not familiar with us or the News Lab, uh, you can find out more information about the News Lab at g.co slash News Lab. We have a lot of resources, training material, and tutorials for journalists specifically, but anybody who's creating content, uh, whether that be data visualizations or working with YouTube or Google Plus or Google Earth imagery, there's a whole wide range of uh, resources that are available for you. Uh, so definitely check that out, g.co slash News Lab. We're going to be going over a lot of examples today, and we'll actually list the examples that we're going over in the description of of this YouTube video uh, after the fact. So if you're dialing into this uh, not live, uh, all that information should be readily available to you. Uh, we're also really interested in hearing from you as well. So dial in, uh, check us out. Uh, we ask, actually, you can, you can drop comments right into the comment section of the YouTube channel and we'll grab those. Uh, and use those for uh, points of reflection. But before uh, I speed up all of our time yammering about, I want to introduce Alberto Cairo, uh, who's going to be leading uh, a lot of the discussion here today. Alberto, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure always to talk about graphics and visualization and visual explanations with you. Thank you. So, Alberto, tell me, uh, for those of you who have, uh, for those who have not been exposed to your amazing work before, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and where we can find more information about you before we get started. Yeah, sure. So, I, I, am, a, I, I am a professor at the University of Miami at the School of Communication. My official title is Nye Chair. I have a, an endowed position here at the School of Communication. Uh, I teach courses on uh, information graphics, uh, data visualization, visual explanations, 3D modeling, animation, web, etc. So anything related to the visual display of any kind of information. Those are the courses that I that I teach. We have a whole program around built around that. We have other professors who are, who also teach these kinds of uh, these kinds of courses. My course is basically the introductory level uh, course. is the one that provides the uh, the foundational knowledge that you need to have if you want to produce statistical graphs, map, data maps, or three D animations for communication with the general public. And prior to being a professor, I, I worked in media for for many years. I was infographics director at, at several. In news publications in Spain and also in Brazil. I, in Spain, I was at El Mundo. In Brazil, I was at uh, several uh, several magazines that are that are owned by Global Group of Communication. I have also been a professor at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and I have written a couple of books about uh, visualization and infographics. The first one is titled "The Functional Art." And the second one, which can be read independently from the first one, is called The Truthful Art, which focuses a little bit more on quantitative thinking, critical thinking, and using visualization to explore uh, data. My f website is thefunctionalart.com, www.thefunctionalart.com, and I can be easily found on Twitter as Alberto Cairo. So, you know, follow me if you want. I, I don't tweet about cats or anything family related. I only tweet about how about graphics. That's my passion. That's what I live for. That's great. If you guys are interested in cats, you can follow me on Twitter at Nick Digital. I do post quite a bit about cats on my channel. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Well, Alberto, thanks again uh, for joining us. Uh, what do we got today? Well, we have a lot of stuff today. There is a, let me just share my screen here so I can, I can start showing things that I have seen uh, recently. And this is going to be a, a very informal a, a conversation so I'm, uh, I'm seeing you now <laughs> twice so um so one of the most exciting things about uh, the current uh, landscape in visualization and, and infographics is that there's a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of work i'm just browsing through the many links that i have open here things that i would like to discuss today uh, i i actually wrote the other day in my website website that uh, one of the, a very exciting feature about the present is 
the amount of good work that is being produced uh, by many uh, people out there. I tend to focus mostly on um, a visualization produced by news media, but I, have, I am going, I'm going to also highlight uh, projects that were done by people who are not journalists. The thing is that um, visualization can be found everywhere, and it's, that's, a, that's a great thing. And I see tons of very, very, very good projects, and that's a, a extremely exciting. At the beginning of my career, it was hard, relatively hard to find a good examples of, of visualization to get inspired by or to copy from, to copy good ideas from. Today, the situation is completely the opposite. There is so much, so much good work being done these days that it's, it's actually overwhelming. I mean, it's, it's difficult to keep up. And actually, that's one of the reasons that I try to tweet only about this stuff, because I try to curate a list of you know projects that I really like that are worth highlighting, etc. So um, well, first of all, I have a couple of, of Google uh, Trends projects. Um, just full disclosure, I am a consultant with Google, so it's important to remember that. So I didn't participate in these projects directly, but it's important to remember that I'm working on other projects right now as a as a consultant. So I'm uh, working directly with uh, with Simon Rogers. The first thing that I would like to highlight today is uh, this article that Simon wrote about one of the latest projects that uh, Google uh, News Lab, Google Trends put together, uh, which is called the Alternative Olympic Medal Table, uh, which is a, a quite engaging project that lets you see the medal table. This is a project itself, so I can visit the podium. So you can see the total number of medals won by each country in the world, and then you can basically weigh these numbers by things such as population, GDP, Olympic love, sports fans, and searches, Google searches uh, of terms that are related to healthy eating. So I think that this is a very simple, very straightforward uh, uh, project, but uh, it's quite well done, I think. And uh, it's engaging, it's interesting. And But what I like the most about it, it's not really related to data visualization per se. What I really like about it is these animated icons that you have over here. They are so, so cute, right? I mean, one of the things that we forget sometimes, I believe, in data visualization is how important it is to make the graphic engaging and how, in some cases, when it is appropriate, how important it is to make people laugh when they, when they get to a project. If you just show the data, right, if you only do a bar graph, a line chart, a scatter plot, a data map, or whatever, and you do it well, you may present the information clearly, right? So that's the most important thing. I usually emphasize to my students and people who attend my workshops that the priority should be to present the information clearly yeah. and straightforwardly and, and deeply. It's also important to care about depth, so showing the right amount of information. But right after that, you know, if you can include a note of humor in your project, like a little animation, a little unobtrusive pictogram on one of the corner. I really like this one with the little, <laughs> and that's just so funny. I have a little bag and the cell phone and the, I don't know the tie, etc. That's it's, it's it's super super nice. I think uh, if if they don't those elements, if they don't interfere with the data, I think that they can actually enhance the experience and and it can they can improve understanding as well because they bring you in basically. What you want to do is to bring attention to the story and then right after that deliver this story so there's something that we can learn we can learn i believe from this project now feel feel free to chime in I'm, I'm, i speak too fast as you know already so if you have any comment about any of the projects that i'm presenting just you know just let me know definitely no i think it's a spot on yeah and we're, we're also looking uh just for people who are watching dialing right now we got about 20 people that are actually online right now feel, feel free to you know post your questions or comments in the comment section of the youtube page uh if you have thoughts or comments about anything that we're talking about today we'll uh answer those yeah, yeah we can we can read the questions live and then we can address them i can open new browser windows etc now another another google project that i have seen recently um, it's actually displayed in this Washington Post page. It's about the most viewed uh, videos done by or related to the candidates to the American presidential election. So the, uh, one of the funny things that I found uh, that I saw by this is that the most popular video related to Donald Trump is basically a commercial about his, uh, his private jet, which is kind of awkward. It's kind of odd. You, you need to see that. But, but anyway, the graphic is at the bottom of the page, so you can go down here. And this is a Google, a Google Trends project uh, done by a, a, a company called Polygraph, and more specifically by, 
by, by Matt Daniels, if I'm not wrong. And I saw this project right before it was launched. And I cannot claim any you know, responsibility or, or, or any credit in, 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 in how good this project is, because I just saw it at the very end of the process when it was about to be launched. But I think that this is a great, this is a great example of how to use uh, what in cartography is called a choropleth map, right? In combination with, with a bar graph over here that shows you the variation of popularity of, of, of these videos. So all, all over the United States. So basically the graphic lets you see first uh, uh, the, the, the comparison between the two candidates, right? When videos related to Hillary Clinton were more popular than videos related to Donald Trump. And you can use this slider to move these from the left, which is October 2015. And then you start moving it to the right and you can get, you know, the data up to June 2000 and 2016. So first of all, you can compare one candidate to the other. For example, right now I am in a in a date when Donald Trump videos were more most, more popular than Hillary Clinton videos. And then you can see the candidates separately. So you can click on Trump and see the relative popularity of tr Trump-related videos uh, all over the United States. And then you can do the same with Clinton videos. So there is nothing extraordinarily creative in the way that the, the information uh, is presented, is being presented. This is just a straightforward a, a bar chart, a, which represents time. It's a time series chart, actually, in, in bar chart form. And then a choropleth map. So there's nothing really fancy here. But I think that the interface is so neat. It's so well done. And, 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 and everything works so well. You can actually click, obviously, on, on each on one of these and then get the specifics over here. So you can hover over. You're interested in, in learning what happened in your state, you can just uh, do that and start exploring. So it's it's really well done, I think. It's, it's, there's something there's something sophisticated, I think, about, about this project, something that speaks about how relevant um, the elegant design is mm. uh, in visualization as well. Yeah, that's what I was, I was really thinking while you were kind of talking about this. And actually, if you click, click back over to that, um, yeah. you know, the, the elegance, I think, of this and the simplicity of it, um, both in just you know quickly looking at it and, and kind of browsing around uh, as a casual viewer, but if you actually wanted to go deeper into this, it really provides that ability to kind of drill in and find information that might be very hyper relevant to your own state or where you might be located. Um, yeah. As far as like chloropleth maps and, and, and taking advantage of data like this, and you know in this case, this is taking a look at Google Trends data. Um, you know how. You know, what, what's the workflow uh, that you would recommend for somebody to, to take a data set, whether that be Google Trends data or another data set, and then get it to a map uh, of this quality? I mean, are we, are we talking about using, uh, you know, Google Maps and, uh, you know, well, I mean, yeah, fusion tables, or is this third-party tools? Yeah, or I mean, you can you can certainly try to do it with a, a out-of-the-box tools. There are many tools nowadays that let you do choropleth maps similar to this one, even in, in interactive format. Now, if you want to do something that is um, a, tailored to your needs, I mean, something that you can basically, in which you can basically control every single feature, every single variable, every single detail of the design of the graphic, I think that the way to go would be to use JavaScript, uh, JavaScript-related technologies. I just went again to the to the top over here. There we have that odd video by with Donald Trump. So, I mean, the entire page is basically an HTML page with videos that have been embedded, right? But then the graphic itself, it's uh, it's JavaScript. And probably in the background, I, if I remember well, this may be a D3. Mm -hmm. a D3 is, uh, and, and, and Matt can correct us later on in the comment section if this is wrong, but D3 is a JavaScript library uh, that was created mainly by a programmer called a, a, a Mike Bostock a while ago, and it's quickly becoming the standard in, in interactive data visualization because it's extremely flexible. It's JavaScript based. That means that it's basically web native. So you're, you're dealing with the, you're dealing with DOM here. And, um, and it's very powerful and it, it's tailored specifically to present information this way. Now the downside of D3 is that it's relatively hard to learn. If you're not a programmer already, if you're not a web developer already, um, and I am neither of those, uh, the learning curve of D3 can be a little bit steep. But it can be learned. If someone like me can learn something like this, and I'm pretty certain that I can learn it well in the future, I believe that anybody can learn it. Uh, but in the meantime, I, while you learn you know, a pro JavaScript programming and then D3 programming or coding, you can, you can start working with, with out-of-the-box tools 
there are many open source options. Google tools are, are, are some of them, but there are many there are many others out there. There is, a, for example, not for interactive maps, but for for static maps, for instance, um, there is a, a, a very very good a, a open source GIS program. A GIS stands for a Geographic Information System, a called Quantum GIS QGIS, which is a tool that I'm planning to use this semester with my students. A quantum GIS, you can download it for free, and it's a very, very powerful mapping tool. And uh, there is a very good uh, tutorial about quantum GIS that I discovered recently. And you can see it, if you go to my website, thefunctionalart.com, on the upper right corner, there is a tutorials and resources section. This is a, a section that I am updating a, on a regular basis with Tutorials that I record myself about software tools. So for instance, lately I have been recording several tutorials about another free tool called Insight, which is excellent to produce statistical charts. I will record something about Adobe Illustrator soon. Well, down here I am putting other resources, so tutorials that were done by other people. Well, there's a great introduction to Quantum GIS over here. So if you, if you want to get started in mapping, Quantum GIS, I think, will be one of the, uh, of the tools that you can try that you can try to use because it's free and it's open source. It's a great, it's a great a thing to to learn. Okay. All right, so we have that, we have that, we have that. Let's see what we have next. Oh, Olympics related stuff. Uh, we mentioned that before. All right, so there's there's tons of stuff about the about the Olympics. And and yes, full disclosure, I am not a huge sports fan, so I didn't really follow the Olympics. I have not even seen a single uh, Olympic competition this time. I never do that, but I, I have kept an eye on, on several uh, visualizations, Olympic-related uh, visualizations. And one of my favorite ones is actually this one by the Washington Post, uh, which lets you uh, see the relative sizes of objects related to, to sports. So uh, it's a scale. You can see that there's a scale over here that goes balls, equipment, courts, arenas, fields. But this is scrollable. So basically, you begin by seeing the smallest objects possible, the table tennis ball, the golf ball, the badminton, oh, shuttlecock. I have learned a new word. Now, if you start scrolling down, right, you start seeing other objects. Let me see if I can minimize it a little bit. There you go. That's the right size. So you can start scrolling down and get larger objects. And as you can see, the transitions are animated, and they are very smooth. So this is a this is very pleasurable to navigate. It's a delight to navigate. I took a look at it. I scrolled up and down. You know, I, I hover over these things. I, I took a look at it by the way at this at me at my uh, in my cell phone, and it looks it looks good as well. So it's a it's a great project. I think I really like the uh, the interface. I really like the navigation. I really like the illustration style. I think that that is that is really great as well. I think that is very the, 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 the vector illustrations here are really well done. And above all, I really really like these animated pictograms that the uh, the Washington Post is using for most of or all the graphics that had they have been publishing. Uh, even if he's not credited here, these are the authors of this graphic. But these pictograms were done by a Spanish graphic designer. His name is Alvaro Valiño and a very talented graphic designer based in, in DC. So this will be my first choice for a Olympics a graphics, I think. I have another one. All right, let me see. This is, I have the entire list over here. So uh, the New York Times. And the New York Times has produced tons of great graphics during these Olympics, right? So I am not going to uh, fully show you the, the entirety of the collection of graphics that they have done. Uh, but they have done a couple of things that are that really really caught my eye because they are so so much fun. They did graphics, for example, based on photographs. They they do composites of several photographs to explain uh, the motions of uh, of athletes, etc., and, and, and explanation graphics, etc., of the maneuvers of certain athletes in certain categories of the Olympics. Those were great and they look fantastic. But my favorite one was actually a much simpler one. Which is this is this very simple graphic by by Gregor H. Larry Buchanan and Derek Watkins, which is titled "Can You Beat Usain Bolt Out of the Blocks?" Basically, you can get that Bolt's reaction time is zero point one fifty five of a second at the starting blocks. Now you need to turn up your volume. I'm going to do that right now. <coughs> you click on "I'm Ready," and then when you get on your marks, set, go. And then, oops, 0 0.294 uh, 
All right, well, it says that bold just barely aged me out, right? And then you get, you know, several graphs down here that show you the breakdown of those results. So you can explore the information further. So if you take a look at these, what they have done is actually create a very straightforward data story. This is, I mean, your traditional data story is made of a combination of data graphs and maps and tables and perhaps a couple of photographs here and there. But in order to get you interested, to engage you at the very beginning, they put like a, like a video game-like feature here at the very beginning. It's so simple. It's such a genius idea. I think that this was great. I, I believe I don't have data to back me up on this hunch. This is just a hunch. But I have the hunch that this project, you know, a huge part of the uh, probably many hits that he had, the many visits that he had, uh, probably they were related to the fact that they had this very engaging component at the very beginning. So that made people stop here and then read further. If you just present the story, if you just present the data to people, well, perhaps some people will not get interested in that data. Perhaps they, they will say, well, perhaps this is a little bit too much, etc." But if you put people in a good mood at the, ver at the very beginning, at the outset, I think that people will get more, you know, will feel more prompted to read your story. I think that is a great, another great example of how to engage people, right? I think it's a, such a good, important point there, Alberta, too. You know, you know, just clicking, clicking back to that that visualization we were just looking at there. You know, I think oftentimes what you see is like they'll just someone will just drop a data visualization into a piece with with no kind of boundaries or no uh, like context or no kind of explanation around it or or no way to kind of lead somebody into that experience. And I think like you know, if we were to reconfigure this particular example and, and put the data visualization up top. Um, you know, it might be less relevant or less clickable, you know, and I think that, you know, having an interactive that's fun, that's engaging, that, that gets people into the spirit of thinking about this particular piece. And it puts um, you at the center. That's another very important thing. It puts you at the center of the graphic. It makes mm -hmm. you become part of the data set. Because if, if you take a look at the histogram down here that shows you how many readers got each mark, okay, the height of these bars here correspond to the number of readers, that got each one of the marks over here. You can see that more, mo most of them are close to my own mark. I am slightly faster than 80% of readers, but I'm not nearly, uh, you know, I'm not close enough to, to be involved, obviously. But it shows me in the data set, right? right? It doesn't just show the entire data set. It shows myself, it shows me here, right? So I think that that's another, another element that, that make, make graphics uh, interesting. I think that when I, we went over these in a previous chat, in a previous hangout, where I mentioned that, for instance, if you're going to show people, you know, the distribution of income, of relative income in the United States, don't just show me the entire data set. I mean, for sure, do that. But first of all, ask me what my income is, and then show me where I am, where I stand in comparison to the, race, the, to the rest of people in the United States or the rest of people in the world. Just by doing that, by adding that small feature, right? I, call, I like to call that the me factor. Um, I, I think, and again, this is just a hunch, that you're making your graphic much more engaging and much more attractive. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I think the other element there too is, um, I mean, well, just one, <laughs> just kind of like anecdotally, you know, it's kind of amazing to me that uh, Usain Bolt's uh, speed of running is faster than most people could actually just get their finger to move. Um, mm. You know, and I think that context and that kind of juxtaposition really kind of highlights just how fast this man really is and how extraordinary it is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, there are actually people here that work faster than he was. That's actually quite interesting, right? Well, if this is just a click of a button, obviously. <laughs> it's not if you start running in a real competition, right? So anyway, very engaging. Now, related to the Olympics also, I would like to highlight the work of The Guardian. All right, one thing, one thing that I mentioned uh, in, a, in a recent uh, blog is that uh, the dominance of um, media publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post in terms of producing visualization sometimes obscures a little bit the great work that is being done by slightly smaller in terms of a graphics department size of other organizations like The Guardian, for instance, right? So I added here a list of graphics that were done by The Guardian team uh, which is led by, uh, by a good friend of mine, uh, Shaquin uh, Gonzalez, and, and I have several friends in the team as well. So I'm a little bit biased. I also have a, a couple of ex-students in The Guardian over there, uh, Fielding uh, uh, Cage, for instance, who was in The Guardian US, and Monica Olmano. But anyway, they, they are, they, I think that they are fantastic. It's, uh, and they, they have done a great job in uh, the, the, the projects that you will be able to see through the links that we are providing 
uh, will show you anything from you know a, a photographic compositions and graphics built on photographs to uh, the use of a 3D animation like this one uh, in, in, in a visualization. This is a basically a stepper, all right? And, and then you can just uh, get to the end and you can click on next and, and you will get the uh, finish line and you will get this comparison. For some reason, this is not, I need to reload this. I think that this has to do with how much I have uh, changed the size of my uh, browser, how much I have zoomed in. But anyway, so this is a, these are all great projects. I think that they are very styly. They are very well done. Um, another thing, by the way, uh, the Guardian graphics is another thing that I really like. They are extremely colorful. And this is something that is, the con that is in great contrast to the style of visualization that we are used to seeing in, in the United States, particularly because of the huge influence that the New York Times has on many news publications on this side of the ocean, right? So the New York Times color palette is, is very subdued, is based on pastel colors, is really, really nice, very elegant. The Guardian color palette is much more colorful. It is still elegant, it still makes the graphics really readable, but it's a little bit more colorful, right? It makes the, uh, the projects a little bit more lively, I think, a, and, and, and also very attractive, right? So I really like that about their style as well. You know, that actually brings up a really interesting question too, Alberto. You know, are, are there cultural considerations to be uh, made whenever creating a data visualization? And like, you know, it, does your audience uh, and like what they've grown to expect as far as like a, a graphic sensibility or a color palette, uh, you know, how much does that play into like how you decide what to, how to design your, your next visualization? Well, I think that I, I don't know if there are really cultural differences. I think that human brains work basically the same everywhere, right? So there are certain rules in the use of color that you can learn from, for example, I'm going to start recommending books. I love doing, doing this, right? From the books by uh, Colin Ware, for instance. Uh, Colin has written several excellent books about, about data visualization. First one is actually called Information Visualization. In, uh, it's on its third edition now, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so he has written extensively about how to use color effectively in data visualization. And many others have written about color. For instance, uh, Rob Simon, uh, who used to work at uh, NASA, uh, let me see, Rob Simon Color. So Simon is with two M's. So Rob, a while ago, he wrote a series of articles titled Subtleties of Color. So it's six articles about how to effectively use color in data visualization. So there will be, this will be like, the universal principles in using color in data visualization, right? But within these constraints, I think that there's a lot of variety that we can apply in terms of how we use color palettes, right? So uh, it's not, we cannot really say that the Guardian's color palette is worse than the New York Times color palette, right? It all depends on your personal tastes, for example. And it all depends on the kind of publication. So that is when the cultural consideration may come in, right? So, for instance, um, America, U.S. visualizations, particularly in, in, in publications of the Times and the Wall Street Journal, and even the Washington Post, color palettes tend to be quite subdued. But if you go to, you know, media top publications and quality publications in a country like Brazil, a uh, graphics tend to be more colorful, more similar to what the Guardian is doing. So there's not really nothing intrinsically. Uh, there's not really anything intrinsically uh, right or wrong in using one color palette or the other. Then another thing that really intrigues me, and again, I don't have any, any data to back me up here, but um, the other day, a, a month ago actually, I had lunch with a professor a, from the University of Miami who teaches um, a, a finance, but he has done a richest projects about how people perceive statistical charts. And uh, he did a project in which he basically showed a, a trend line in the in a stock, right? So stock. Let me just search for a graphic here. Stock, a chart, or let me just look for a random stock chart. So he basically did a graphic like let's see, this one. So a, a graphic, a, a chart showing a stock going down sharply, right? And then he uh, he created two versions of that graphic. One of them, in one of them, the, the line was color red, and then on the other one, the line was color black. And I have not read the paper, but he described the results to me. And it turns out that at least with a, a, a US a users, a, the red line was perceived as worse uh, than the uh, than the black line. Even if the slope of the chart, the slope of the line, is exactly the same. <laughs> the, the drop of the of the of the value of this particular company or stock or whatever was perceived as sharper, uh, as more as steeper if the line is color red. 
that's so interesting, right? And I, I asked him, well, I, that got me curious because um, I think, this, again, this is just a hunch, that this is related to the fact that, uh, in, at least in the Western world, red is uh, equated usually to danger or mm. to something that is bad or, or threatening, right? But, it, you know, I think, and again, correct me, people who know a lot about Asia, but I, that there are Asian countries, particularly China, where red is a, po a color that has positive connotations, right? It would be really interesting to see if you do the same experiment in Asian countries, if you will get the same results. It may happen that you get the same results, but it may happen that you don't get the same results, right? That the, the result will be the opposite, that the red line actually is perceived as better than the black line. Who knows, right? So that's so interesting, right? There's a lot of research to be done in visualization. Actually, that leads me to one of the last links that I was uh, that I was proposing. I think that people that people who want to learn about graphics, uh, we really need to read about the papers that come from the world of academic uh, data visualization. There is a, a com growing community of academics, particularly coming from a, a, a departments of computer science, but also mathematics and statistics, who have been doing research about how people perceive and use data visualizations, right? Using a research, uh, doing research based on, on, on readers. And uh, one of the best sources to find, to learn about the uh, research that is being done nowadays is uh, Robert Cosara's uh, website. His website is eagereyes.org. And uh, I use him all the time. I visit this website on a regular basis just to get links to papers, to new papers. Uh, Robert is also a great advocate for um, uh, researchers becoming better communicators. Actually, the, the latest uh, post that he wrote is about uh, recommending researchers to communicate their results. So instead of just publishing their papers in, in, in specialized publications, what Robert proposes is that certainly do that just yes, because you need to get tenure in your university but besides doing that perhaps create a website in which you explain general audiences the main takeaway right graphic designers perhaps that are not very familiar with the literature academic literature in data visualization can greatly benefit from learning what you have discovered in your uh, in your experiments right so uh, it's it's interesting i believe for visualization designers to read about research as well right so just visit try to visit robert's uh, robert's website robert works for tableau software by the way he's a great guy great writer very opinionated also yeah i think that's such yeah, an important that's point too Alberto is that you know I think all too often we get caught up in just producing the content and sending it out there and, and don't spend enough time kind of going back and looking at uh, why we did something or how we went about it or even just like the the pitfalls that we encountered uh, along the way and I think all of that information is incredibly useful for someone who's just starting out uh, yeah. or even someone who's you know very experienced you know I think I think all of these lessons kind of kind of feed back um, and, and help people learn uh, more quickly. We actually have a couple comments uh, that have come in uh, just in the last uh, few minutes here. Uh, Devangana, I am probably messing up their name, uh, but they say, what would your choice of tools or technology be if you had graphs with over a million nodes on your website and you wanted to provide interactive interactivity for users? One million nodes, so that I assume that this is going to be a, we're talking about network diagrams here, right? Uh, I'm assuming so, yeah. Okay, well, I'm not really, I'm not really, I'm not really familiar with the literature about a, a node-based connection a, or network diagrams. Um, I believe that there is a book coming out about that, so I would encourage you to go to Amazon and search for that. The other recommendation that I have is that you visit and follow on Twitter uh, my former colleague, uh, Lynn Cherney. So Lynn uh, taught visualization here at the University of Miami as a visiting professor until very recently. And she's an expert in, in coding, in linguistics, and other, uh, also in, in network analysis and, and visualization. And so if you follow her on Twitter, she tweets all the time about graphics. And if you go back in her timeline, probably she has tweeted about resources that can be used for that. Or you can check her blog. Her blog also provides tons of resources for that. I, I tend to focus a little bit more on a quantitative data rather than a network diagrams. So Lynn knows about everything, but she has uh, written about it, I believe, or she knows quite a lot about it. 
Um, so I can help that much with that. But I can still point out people who know much more than I do about everything. You know, that's, that's sometimes the, the, the best thing I, I love saying. I don't have that answer, but I can find someone who does. Uh, looks like uh, Luca Hammer actually replied back uh, on this. He said, zoomable graphs are good if there are too many nodes for real interactivity. They would, he would try to cluster the data and don't show everything all at yeah. once. Yeah, he, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. But, th but that's a strategy that applies the strategy that applies to any kind of graphic, right? Not only network diagrams, but um, a, but that, but also data graphs and and, and data maps, etc. If you remember a, a one of the graphics that that I showed before, the um, uh, the one by Google, the um, uh, the one showing the the map of a uh, Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton in terms of uh, YouTube videos, that begins with the overview, right? First of all, you see the entire map. And then you can click and zoom in, etc. So there's a strategy of visualization design that was, um, I believe that it was defined by a Schneiderman, by Ben Schneiderman, which is a overview and then details, zoom and details on the map. That's the strategy that he proposed. And he, we call that the, the visual, I'm seeing that right now, the visual information, information seeking mantra, right? So it's like provide first an overview, then a zoom, filter, details on the map in order to see a relationship. So rather than showing those two million data points at once, first of all, provide some clusters or groups, aggregate your data at a higher level first, and then let people just zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, or do searches. I mean, search boxes are also essential uh, nowadays uh, in data visualization as well, not only clickable filters. Huh? So yeah, that's certainly a very wise, a very wise reply to the question. Yes, that's great. And like Luca actually recommended, also he said Sigma JS was one of the best performing libraries he's worked with for uh, network visualizations in the browser. H have you ever used uh, Sigma JS? Are you familiar with that? No, no, I have never. I am, I am a complete ignorant when it comes to JavaScript. I know elementary JavaScript, and uh, I mean working level elementary JavaScript, and very, very extremely elementary D three. So that's a world that I still need to, to explore myself. I, I use mostly another programming language called R, which is used mostly for, for analysis and, and data exploration. So JavaScript, uh, the depths of JavaScript is actually a, a world that I still need to explore. Planning to use probably my, um, I'm going to take probably a semester off a year and a half from now, around the beginning of 2018. I will probably use those six or eight months to uh, to really really dig into into all these new technologies because there's a lot of things going on in the JavaScript world. It's not just other you know um, uh, tools to do uh, node network diagrams, but there's also another um, a JavaScript library that lets you uh, do 3D interactive 3D called 3JS. Uh, 3JS. Let me see if I can find it. 3.js. I believe that is the uh, that is there you go. 3JS. So one of my students last semester, I will write about this um, probably in my blog soon, taught herself to use 3DJS, uh, uh, three, sorry, 3 sorry, 3.js uh, for one of my classes. And she basically created a 3D model of an object in a 3D program called Maya, which is one of the programs that I teach. And then she was able to export that, the 3D model, and import it into JavaScript and make it interactive through uh, 3JS. So, and, and, you know, that makes me feel like oh, I, I do need to learn this stuff, right? Because it's, it's just so, so nice, right? And I think that's also, like, a really interesting point, too. I mean, you know, one would assume someone who has your breadth and depth and just history of knowledge on this stuff that you would, you would just automatically know every program that you would need. But, I mean, you know, we're all lifetime learners, right? There's always more to learn. There's always more to explore. And I, th I think that's one of the things I try to encourage many of my, my, my students and the people that we're, we're teaching is that, you know, you, you can't just, like, you know, assume that you'll learn things and be done you know there will always be more to learn and more to grow and and one of the one of the exciting but also scary things about learning is that the more that you learn the more you realize how much you need you still need to learn it's like you know it's a you, the, you, the, the the expansion of your knowledge basically uncovers things uh, uncover uncovers new gaps in your knowledge right so it's like an ever expanding in the truthful art in my latest book actually i i use um a, a metaphor that I really like for knowledge called the island of knowledge. Mm. And the, the metaphor is based on a, on a very famous quote that says, uh, the larger the island of knowledge, the longer the shoreline of wonder. <laughs> and it means that the more you expand your own knowledge, the shoreline 
which is basically the point where you can envision how much you still need to learn, right? It also grows larger, right? So you need to decide, you need to prioritize. So it's impossible to learn absolutely everything really, really well. It is possible to get um, a working understanding of most technologies related to visualization. So you can learn about charts and about maps and about JavaScript and about data analysis with R, web scraping with Python, web technologies based on, on, on Ruby or whatever. You can learn, you can get a basic understanding of all that. But then, you know, if you, if you want to really get good at something, then you really need to embrace it, right? You need to go deeper into it. And, and while you're going deeper into that, probably new technologies are, are appearing here and there on the side, right? So there's always something to be learned. And that really excites me. I think that it's a, it's a great feature of the modern world. Yeah, I think I think that's just one of the one of the most exciting things is that there is just so much access to this information now too, and so much of it's free. You know, you don't have to pay yeah. for these things. It's really just that your time is the, is the most uh, largest investment there. Um, I got a couple other questions that came in uh, while we were talking. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ruin this person's name again. I apologize, Devangana. Apologize. Uh, says one more question. How do we make sure that we don't induce our own biases into the visualizations that we're building? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well, okay, so I have written a whole book about that. <laughs> and, and I didn't even cover probably 1% of everything that needs to be learned about that. All right, that comes before. I, I believe that part of, the, part of the answer to that comes when you are building the actual model behind the graphics. So when you are analyzing the data. And, and obviously, one of the replies to that would be to um, uh, learn really well how to avoid the most common kinds of mistakes, right? you know, motivated reasoning, and confirmation bias, and you know, making sure that you're applying the right, the right models and the right, the right technologies, etc. Um, so if, to do that, obviously, if you are a journalist like me, there, you cannot do it all on your own. Just because uh, my my knowledge of statistics is is good enough uh, to do graphics, but I'm not an expert. So I always go to experts. So always seek for, always look for help. Uh, an additional pair of eyes, or more, more pair of our, pair of pairs of eyes, you know, looking at your data can really help you identify possible biases in the data. Uh, that's another thing. Besides getting your own knowledge, all right, putting your own knowledge together and applying your own knowledge, you can also look for experts or other or colleagues that are working your same area that can look at your own models. But then that's the most obvious answer. But then the second one is that it is possible also to introduce your own bias when you visualize something by visualizing things wrong, right? So for instance, you know, one of the most common kinds of uh, misleading graphics that I described in the truthful art is a dual scale charts uh, that basically force you to um, uh, force you to see usually correlations that are not really there. So one of the most outrageous examples uh, that I have seen uh, recently comes from a book by Robert Reich, who uh, used to be the Secretary of Labor under President Clinton, Bill Clinton. And he wrote a book called Seeding Capitalism a while ago. And this is one of the charts that appears in the book that shows you the almost perfect relationship that exists between the drop of middle class share of income and the union membership rate. And the two lines are parallel except that each one of the lines is measured against a completely different scale. If you put the two lines at the same scale, well, certainly they, go, they both go down, but not at the same rate, right? Mm -hmm. So these kinds of things is what can introduce bias, in, not in the way that you interpret the data, but in the way that your readers will interpret the data. Because a person who knows a lot about these data will, able, will be able to interpret these data correctly, even if you're using the dual scale chart. But the thing is that, and this is something that scientists and statisticians forget all the time, what you perceive in your own chart is not the same as what a reader will perceive in the chart, particularly a non-trained reader, someone who doesn't know so much as you do about the data that you're presenting. So you better respect certain principles of visualization when you're showing your data. Uh, that's great counsel. You know, so John Barrett uh, has a couple questions. Uh, uh, or, and actually, I'm sorry, uh, Yasmin uh, asked a question up further up. He says, what are the critical questions that should be asked after collecting and visualizing the data to make the story? Oh, okay, so it all depends on the story, right? So uh, it all depends on what you're, what you're trying to show. So for instance, in a, in a story about, you know, if you're trying to establish the relationship between, you know, different variables and, and you work with uh, uh, correlations, 
I actually have an example of that. So uh, let me just tie that to one of the examples that I was about to show. So um, this is a project that was done by NBC News, uh, the over here, uh, by a, a designer and data journalist called Sam Petula. So this is a, lo a long story that explores where uh, Trump, Trump voters in the Republican primaries came from and who they are and what they are educational level is, et cetera. So it's a long exploration of the people who, who voted for Trump during the primaries. It's a very, very nice story. It's a great a, a way of, uh, a great example of how to combine uh, different media, different ways of telling the story. So great photographs, good writing, you know, a, a, and then good graphics, right? One of the charts that I like the most about these, well, there's are some time series charts over here. Down here, there is a there is a scatter plot. Scatter plots are well, or bubble is scatter plot that shows the relationship between on the y-axis the Trump vote and then the uh, a level of distress of, of of white people county by county. Each one of the bubbles here uh, represents one of the countries. Now, what is level of distress? Now, level of distress is basically a, a measure that the data journalist uh, himself calculated by averaging and weighing. Um, uh, several uh, several variables, such as, for example, the variation of income of whites between 2004 and 2014, the uh, what, uh, white labor participation, the uh, poverty rates, etc. So the, he aggregated all those measurements into a single measurement, which is level of distress from zero to 100. So immediately you can see that there is a very close relationship between level of distress and Trump vote, right? The higher the level of distress, the higher the, num the, the, the vote for Trump. The relationship is very clear. Now the question that you need to ask yourself here is, am I aggregating the data correctly, right? Am I, am I doing the aggregation and the weighing correctly? And in order to do that, as I said before, first of all, you need to know a little bit about mathematics and statistics, but you know, a journalist can also can only go that far. So at some point during the process, you need to go to people who really know a lot about this methodology. People who have used you know this kind of aggregation several times in their own in their own research projects, etc., and ask them, "Am I getting this right?" Right. So a journalist always needs to ask, right? And and they will help you identify possible biases. You know, they will help you identify. You need to you need to give more weight to one of the variables rather than averaging all of them together and giving them the same weight. So you need to be always ask yourself if you are doing uh, things, uh, things right uh, in this sense. And then, uh, so this is just an example. So uh, another thing that could be said, uh, particularly about time series charts and other kinds of graphics is, uh, if it is worth uh, representing a confidence intervals on the error margin. There are some many, in many, many, many cases, we don't do that. For example, we have here a line chart that doesn't really show Hey, that well, per, this is our this is percentage Trump supporting polls. So, for instance, in a chart like this, it would be good to show the margin of error above and below. You know, the margin of error in these lines, just to show you that these are not just you know these are not just a, a, a just the, uh, the the data point right that matters. It's also the level of uncertainty around that data point because all the polls that have been aggregated for this chart um, a, have some 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 margin of error built in, right? So it's it's worth asking you if adding the margin of error is meaningful. And in many cases it is, because in some cases the margin of error is so wide and the difference between the point estimates is so short that it may happen that they overlap greatly. So perhaps there's not really a huge difference between one candidate and the other candidate, right? So there are many considerations, right? So I'm, I'm just giving you a couple of a couple of examples. By the way, one of the things that I, I, I was talking to Sam right, right before, the, the, the person who created these graphics, these wonderful graphics, Sam Petula. His work is really amazing, by the way, and they have a very small team. In I was surprised that it's basically himself who's producing all these graphics, right? I, I, I was assuming that NBC News had a huge team producing, you know, such amount uh, graphics of, of great quality, but it's just himself. Well, I was asking him about how he works, etc., and how, how he produced this project, and I was suggesting to him that as long as he did a lot of regression models for charts like these, and he ran, you know, comparisons between different kinds of variables and voting for several candidates all over the primaries, it would be a great idea, I think, to disclose all that, all those calculations, right? So, and, and explain the methodology behind them. That's another thing that I believe journalists could do more. Yeah, um, show, show the work. Show the work. I mean, show the, show the method, right? Show, the, uh, show your data, 
show your calculations and disclose all that, right? Several, there are several news organizations that are doing this on a regular basis, and they do it really well, really well in my opinion. One of them is 538, uh, which uh, whenever it is possible, they release their data freely. They explain their model. So for instance, they have their election forecast, which I highlighted in a previous Hangout because I really like it, so I'm going to show it again. Uh, there is a link somewhere to an article written by Nate Silver in which he uh, explains at great lengths you know, the assumptions behind this model and how the different polls were weigh weighted and, you know, they gave more importance to one poll and to the other and why. So they explain all that, right? And another and, and another organization that does that really, really well is uh, ProPublica, uh, which is, uh, I would say, one of my favorite news organizations at the moment. So every time that they publish a data-driven story, they also disclose the data and they write an article about the methodology that they use. The people who produce visualization and uh, data journalism uh, at ProPublica, they call themselves themselves and themselves a nerd team. So if you search for a uh, nerd blog ProPublica, <laughs> you will find the blog, uh, the collective blog that they that they write, the ProPublica ner nerd blog. So if you want to learn more about ProPublica, just look for the ProPublica nerd blog. You can read more about the projects that they do. And they're a really fantastic organization. And if I'm not mistaken, they're actually currently hiring uh, an engagement reporter. Uh, so no, if you're interested in that, you should, you should yeah. check out that link. I don't really know what that, that position really means, but 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 it, I don't know. A probably a great place to work at. So yeah, I checked out the job description recently on their, on their website. It's uh, it's pretty fascinating. Um, we have one last comment from John Burt that I just want to make sure that we get to. Um, he says, Alberto, what's your feeling on the balance between defining and telling a story with visuals and facilitating viewer exploration or interaction? All right. So well, that's a, one of the key questions that you need to ask yourself, right? My feeling is that whenever it is possible, show readers the main takeaway of the data first, right? So what are the main things in the data? What are the main highlights? What are the most important data points? What is the story that you're trying to show, et cetera? And what is, what, what, tell people what the graphic is showing before you even show the graphic. And then you show the graphic, right? Or you show the complete, the complete graphic. You can first show, for example, a simplified version of the graphic in which you present the main takeaways. It could be, for example, a simple, a series of very simple maps like these ones by, by Sam from NBC News, right? So just, just show you the data at an aggregated level, very simple, very easy to understand. And then right after that, you let them explore. So they scroll down and then get all the details. So you let them, for example, zoom in and look for their own zip code and explore, right? That's, that's, the, that's the structure, the visualization structure that I favor in my own projects because uh, again, I don't have data to back me up on this. This is just a hunch. But I have the hunch based on my own reading experience that, uh, first of all, when I'm reading a story, first of all, I need to have a good headline, a good intro that explains what the story is about, and then I can decide if I want to read the story or not. If you show me the entirety of the graphic, if you show me the entire complexity at the very beginning, right, and if I don't, it's not clear to me where to begin reading, I may not read it. Unless that I am, I am, I am um, interested beforehand in the story that you're about to tell, in which case I will read your graphic, no matter how complex it is, right? Unless that, that happens, I will not read the, that graphic. I will walk away. But if, you're, if you do your graphic like the New York Times did over here, right? you make a, like an introduction, right? Compare yourself to Usain, Usain Bolt, and then you compare myself to the rest of readers. This is the introduction. And then you give me the details, right? You let me explore, you let me scroll, let me scroll down, et cetera, right? So again, as I said before, first of all, a overview, as Ben Schneiderman says, first of all, the overview, and then the details and the, and the zoom and the exploration on demand. Absolutely, and this is fantastic, Alberto. Uh, we have about five minutes left. All right, so let, let, let's move. Let's. I have ten minutes. If we can have use ten minutes because there are several things yeah. I would like to mention here. All right, so I I just wrote about this project this very morning. This is by the Miami Herald. Uh, it's a very simple, very straightforward visualization project tracking cases of Zika in Florida. It's a huge story right now down here in, in Miami, right? So it's very straightforward. There's nothing particularly fancy in this project, but what I mentioned in my blog writing about this project is that 
sometimes when people who write about visualization, and I include myself in that mix, we tend to focus too much on projects that are you know, produced through several weeks and they're super fancy and super complex, and sometimes about topics that are not really relevant to the lives of people, right? And that perhaps we should work more on this kind of project about, you know, on things that are really useful, right? And this is a useful project. It's really well done, very well designed. It was produced by a tiny team. It was just two people working, uh, working together at the Miami Herald. And it's really well designed, right? And it's useful, right, for people. I believe that journalism and as an extension of that news data visualization should be first a service to people and only after a means to, you know, express our own you know, inner creative capabilities or something. So that's an example of that. Another example is this other very, very simple project by Univision Notices. Full disclosure, I also work uh, full, uh, with Univision every now and then. I know the people who work in this organization, uh, and I go to the newsroom every now and then. Well, they also have this spirit, this spirit of service in their veins, right? So they publish this story about how to control asthma, and I am an asthmatic person, and they produce this very simple, a infographic, like a stepper infographic, that shows you uh, 11 things that you need to avoid at your home if you if you are an asthmatic person. And it's so simple, it's very well done. And take a look at how elegant the illustrations are. This leads me to another point that I would like to make today. The rights of data visualization, right, the visualization of abstract, quantitative and qualitative data, has made many organizations out there forget, a, and I believe that they are wrong in forgetting these, that pictorial infographics are also important. Using pictorial explanations like this one can really engage readers as well. And they are extremely important to clarify story, stories like this one sometimes. So this is a great example, I think, of this kind of work. I really love this kind of a isometric perspective illustrations. It was probably done with Adobe Illustrator, which is one of the skills that I teach at the University of Miami, by the way. I teach my students how to produce this kind of graphic, which once you learn the tricks behind it, everybody can, can produce a graphic like this, an illustration like this quite quickly. Uh, I already mentioned NBC's um, a project over here. Oh, that's another one that I shouldn't forget. This is very important. All right, another organization, another one of those media organi online only media organizations, nonprofit organizations like ProPublica out there, the Marshall Project. So the Marshall Project is an organization that does investigative reporting and journalism about the criminal justice system in the United States. Truly excellent organization, great stories, and great visualization. One of the latest ones that they published is titled Crime in Context by Gabriel Dance and Tom Meager. And I encourage you to explore it, particularly the visualization itself, which is down here. Now, this is an interactive visualization to explore violent crime, uh, crimes city by city. You can change the data from raw data, from numbers to rates, from violent crime to homicide, rape. There is so much to be liked in this project. I really love how the interface was integrated with the explainer over here, right? The, the explainer, the text explaining the graphic becomes the interaction, becomes the interface to the graphic, right? And then you can choose cities over here. You can choose a year to begin the graphic, and then you can hover over. You know, you can explore certain features, like you can see the New York, New York, New York City drop in violent crime. Truly excellent visualization, very, very nicely designed, very elegant as well. I really, really love it. And I would encourage you again, as I mentioned before, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, etc., wonderful organizations, but they are not the only ones out there producing great work, right? So let's not forget about, you know, the smaller players in the market. Sometimes they may surprise you. They're really, really great. And then I also included in the list of links um, here uh, that we are going to provide underneath this video, uh, links to several things that I have re seen recently. For example, this is a little tool that was designed by uh, Robert Grant, and uh, it's a tool that lets you draw data. So you begin with an empty canvas, and you can start drawing points in the data, and the, the tool will calculate the average of the data, the standard deviation of the data, the mean of the data, and then the, per the correlation coefficient. So you can start doing that, for example, and it will tell you that the pattern that you're, that you're drawing has a very strong correlation, zero, 0 0.98, obviously, it's almost linear. But if I start doing that, then the correlation will start going down. 
So this is a great way for people who teach statistics and data journalism, etc., to generate fake data sets to use in classes. You can actually download the data table over here. And on Twitter, after seeing this tool, I actually made a joke on Twitter saying that you know, uh, whenever you are exploring data, you should always visualize your data first because if you only rely on these numbers, on the um, summary statistics, you may be misled. You may be, you know, uh, uh, you may have, you, you may not see important patterns in the data. For example, a dinosaur hidden behind your data, right? <laughs> so I did this dinosaur using that tool, and I made that point over here. I'm making T-shirts with a dinosaur like this right now that I'm planning to wear to classes. No kidding about that. Um, <laughs> then also very quickly, this block, very important, also very interesting, higher education data stories. This is a blog that has been that was put together a while ago by John. I always mispronounce his name. John Boykenstedt. Sorry, John. I, 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 if you are listening, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Anyway, I follow this blog just because I, obviously I'm in higher education, so I'm interested in in data related to this. This is a great, great interactive uh, database of a higher education institutions in the United States. So it lets you it lets you basically filter. First of all, you see the total number of a, a, a self-defined higher education institutions in the US. And you can filter these down. For example, you can say, they offer BAs, yes or no, no. Uh, they offer master's degree, yes, or et cetera. And you can start searching for them. And then you can basically use these to show the percent of undergraduate students that belong to certain ethnic groups, right? Or races, Hispanic, Asian, African American, etc. So I played with this tool for quite a while, just exploring the data, right? right? So, and then you can also search for selectivity: most selective, very selective, non-selective, moderately selective. So it's a delight to use. Right? A very, very interesting project. I wouldn't like to finish the hangout today without recommending Visual Loop. Now, uh, one of the uh, recommendations that I make for my students every semester is to go to pages like Visual Loop. And, and, and look for the work of uh, designers here and copy what they do. So, it's, so Visual Loop is, is a great source of inspiration if you are developing your own style in, in graphics. Let's suppose that you don't have any experience whatsoever in graphic design, infographics, data visualization, etc., and you want to get started. Well, if you want to know how I got started, I, I began my career in 1997 by copying the style of other people. So. I look for you know the work of a famous graphic designers like John Greenway, for example, who at the time used to work at a Condé Nast Traveler magazine, and I could I copied his style. I didn't copy his graphics, obviously that would be plagiarism, but I copied the style, his style, right? So my first graphics in my first of my career they look very much like John Greenway infographics. Well, anyway, Visual Loop is a website that collects infographics and data visualization done from by designers from all over the world. Okay, so if you click on visualloop.com, they have several galleries of infographics. People can post their own infographics here. You, they also have a news section in which um, the person behind Visual Loop, Tiago, also writes articles and presents his favorite examples of infographics that he has seen recently. So there, he publishes inspiring infographics on a regular basis. Huge collection of infographics, great for inspiration. And then, um, I also posted a link to this article by Bob Taylor, who is a physicist, I believe based in Britain, in the United Kingdom. It's a great exploration of a Brexit. And if you remember Brexit, most of the maps that we saw in media looked like this. It says, yes or no, right? Where the yes won, where the no won, etc. So I am not going to bore you with the details here. I would just encourage you to follow the link and read this article. because. This article, using several data maps, using several charts, etc., actually reveal several voting patterns that are actually quite interesting and quite revealing. And I really like how the article ends. It ends by saying, life is messy and so is data. That is actually the point that the article proves, that the story, regardless of what you do with your visualization, is always going to be much more complicated than you first thought. And the last things that I put over here, are just links to several articles that I saw uh, with educational resources. One of them by ProPublica, another one uh, by a, a, by a Cooney, and another one. I don't remember what the one, what the third one was. Um, let me see if I can find it. It's over here. 
Um, oh, is this, the third one is the ProPublica one. Oh, I don't remember what the first two are. So um, the first two, this is the Jonathan Stray one by CUNY University. And I also posted links to a couple of articles about typography. Um, there is an ongoing conversation in visualization nowadays about how to better set type for graphics. And I have not seen any specific examples of articles or um, papers about typography for visualization. But we can just go beyond the boundaries of visualization, right? The visualization field and go, for example, to UX and web design field. And there is plenty that has been written about how to set type correctly for the web, right? So what I have posted here is a couple of links to articles that cover typography for the web. I think that their contents can be extremely helpful if you do infographics or data visualizations for the web. So that is all for today. It's a lot of stuff, right? There's a lot of things that uh, have been going on recently. Mm -hmm. uh, this is fantastic, uh, this is Alberto. I, uh, I, first of all, I just want to thank you again wanted, for you know, providing such an amazing list of resources. resources. I'm going to quickly mute you here just because we got an echo. Um, yeah, just again, thank you for the, you know such an amazing list of resources. I think for people who are getting started or just you know curious about uh, data visualization, I mean, you know, just following the URL links that you provided in the last few uh, office hours are just instrumental in getting people started. Um, hopefully, we can uh, bring you in again in another month uh, and do another one of these if possible. Um, I also just wanted to give a quick shout out to everybody who joined in on the office hour today or in the, in the hangout today. Thank you all for your comments and questions. Uh, Tiago, it looks like uh, uh, he's gave you a thanks for mentioning uh, him in the, uh, the presentation there, Alberto. Uh, but thanks to everybody else who had their questions. If you have additional questions, you can always feel free to drop those into the comment section on the YouTube videos here. Uh, also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to be uh, doing more events similar to this, uh, as well as other office hours and other types of opportunities to get in front of experts uh, in a wide range of different fields. Uh, so definitely subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, check us out on uh, Twitter, at, at Google News Lab. Check out our website, g.co slash news lab. And Alberto, for, for those of you, uh, for those folks who are still hanging on, uh, why don't you let people know where they can find you once again? Oh, they can find me on Twitter. That's one of the main ones. I always post all these kind of stuff on Twitter. And then on my website, thefunctionalart.com, the title of my first book. Fantastic. And we'll be posting links to all of the references that we mentioned today uh, in the office hour uh, in uh, the description of the, uh, of the video. Uh, so again, thank you everybody for joining. We'll see you again, hopefully in a few weeks uh, and stay in touch. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Alberto.